Welcome to episode 21 of the Guns and Yoga podcast. My name is Wendy Hummel. In today's episode, I speak with Amy Morgan, founder and CEO of Academy Hour, an online platform offering mental health training for first responders. I had a lot of fun talking to Amy. Fun may seem like an odd word choice, but when I get to meet and talk to people who are as passionate and enthusiastic about first responder wellness as Amy is, I'm in my happy place. It's encouraging to know that there are good people out there dedicated to supporting our cops, firefighters, paramedics, and dispatchers. Amy and I discussed how she offers numerous classes free of charge to first responders such as ethics, leadership, suicide prevention, burnout, trauma, addiction, and more. Amy discusses how she created Academy Hour out of a need to fill a gap while she was working at the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. She worked with first responders who seemed to be really interested in mental health training. So she started to do lunch and learns on topics like trauma and PTSD, and the rest is history. Amy's passion for her work is apparent, and she drives, which drives her to create her valuable content that is so greatly needed. She developed an online peer support training and certified first responder counselor certification and is working on a program for retirees. Amy also has guest instructors, such as Olivia Mead from Yoga for First Responders and Dan Willis, author of Bulletproof Spirit. Both have been guests on this show. If you're a first responder and you might be interested in taking some of these classes from Academy Hour, you can learn more at www.academyhour.com or you can email them at info at academyhour.com. If you find value in this episode, please share it, give us a review, and if you'd like to be notified of future episodes, you can subscribe on our Podbean website or email us directly at wendy at blueline I'd love to hear from you with questions, suggestions for future guests, or topics that you would like to hear about. You can also email wendy at blueline for this or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, I am so glad you're here too. Um, you and I were just chatting a little bit before I hit record and um, you've got such an amazing background. You're doing so many good things for first responders. So oh, I'm really, you. yeah, I'm really excited for you to share all of that with, with the listeners. Awesome. So you are the founder and CEO of Academy Hour, which is an online training platform um, providing mental health and wellness and leadership training to law enforcement and really all public safety personnel. Yes. You yourself have a master's in counseling, but you made it very clear to me that you are not a therapist. <laughs> and I'll have <laughs> you talk more about that. that. <laughs> uh, and that you started your career um, kind of working with law enforcement when you were the training coordinator for the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. So right. if you don't mind just letting everybody know who you are and, and how you got into this, this line of work. Yeah, sure. Happy to. So yes, as you said, I've trained, I have a master's of counseling, um, master's of science in counseling, and I trained the long track, the LPC track, which is so you start out with like marriage, family, drug, alcohol, and then you move, you get more hours and it's the LPC track, ready to just go in and be what I always I was going to get a doctorate. What I, was, I wanted to do is child psychology. Like since I was a kid, I wanted to be a child psychologist. And so it got uh, delayed a bit just because of life. But I went finally and got my way through that. Um, a bachelor's of science and behavioral science, which ended up being called short BS, a, B, a BS and BS. And I was like, ah, <laughs> finally got my bachelor's of science and behavioral sciences. And that's what it's called. But um, and then I went on and got my master's of science in counseling and I was so excited and I started working with kids and I absolutely hated it. And I was so disappointed because it's just, I just wanted to be a counselor so bad. And so I switched out of the, um, the child, the, the ch working with children thing because it was just, it felt like a lot of futility um, to me. And so I moved into marriage counseling and I hated it. <laughs> Again, uh, it felt like an act of futility. It, it was just frustrating for me because I... I just thought this is what I wanted to do forever. And when I finally was able to, I, I found out I didn't like it at all. And so um, I, the reason was, I think I'm just not into the ongoing maintenance, the seeing people week after week and a glimpse at a time. And, I, you know, I'm into more an intense, tangible difference and so forth. So I, I was working for the suicide, um, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at the time. 
Um, and so I was doing suicide interventions and that sort of thing. And it turned out, it just turns out over the course that I learned all of this, that I, I like, um, Christ, this is going to sound where I love crisis intervention. That's really not to me, but I like the, the intensity of that, the, um, it's, it's kind of like being like a first responder, the, 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 the adrenaline rush and those things, somebody working in the emergency room rather than, um, you know, the night shift in the ICU. Like it's, it's that, that we need somebody for every one of those roles. But if you prefer the emergency department to the ICU and you stick someone in the ICU, they're just like, oh my God, like I need to be doing something. And they're like, you are doing something. No, I need to be tangibly. So that's kind of what I, 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 I think that's why I ended up hating it. And so I don't, I didn't even finish my practicum, which was the, um, the next, the, the last step towards completing my license. And I ended up, uh, at the time I was working for the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation doing training, coordinating training. And I taught a class. Uh, I had friends that were investigative agents that would go out in the field and come back from a crime scene, a murder, whatever, homicide, whatever it was, and, and tell me and make their sick jokes about things. And I was like, you people are just, that's just wrong. Like, I didn't get it, you know, at the time. And and then I had friends that worked in the in the Internet Crimes Against Children, the ICAC unit, and they were telling me the things that they saw every day, all day, and were listening to and, and how it was affecting them. And they'd only been, you know, one of them, this lady, she had no children of her own at the time, but she was like, I, I've been in this this job for a year and a half, and I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do it. And, and that's after a year and a half of any job. You shouldn't be burned out, but that was just such a hard job. So I, so I thought, you know, I just got my master's. Like, let me teach something on PTSD. And I did like a brown bag, a lunch and learn kind of thing. And everybody showed up. And, and, it, and it got great. Uh, like, they're like, well, you need to teach more on, on mental health stuff. And this was seven, eight years ago before it was cool to do mental health in a, in a law enforcement agency. They didn't have a peer support team. They didn't have any of that, any wellness program at all. Um, and, and I wouldn't really, really didn't even know to build a wellness program at the time. I just thought I'm going to teach a class. And so then I taught a class because my expertise is trauma and suicide. I taught a class on, on suicide prevention. And it was just a really basic how to talk someone through it, kind of how to, how, to, how to talk to someone, how to listen to someone, how to get them connected to help and so forth. Or signs to look for in someone that was thinking suicide, really high level. And people just kept asking for So we ended up, you know, I ended up creating a bunch of classes there. It turned into me creating a lot of classes, which I then turned into my online training, which has turned into Academy Hour, which is, you know, I am where I am now, um, just teaching as much as I possibly can. And I realized that teaching is my forte and my strength and writing curriculum is really my favorite. Coming up, you know, having the concepts and then turning it into a how does it apply to people and how do I get them to listen and how do I get them to, to really use this information to make a difference in their lives? And so that's, that's the long way around to why I don't do counseling. I don't want to do counseling. Um, but I, I do end up doing interventions and I do love, the, love teaching, love the teaching part of it. So, And there's so many different ways to be able to support and provide and, you know, you know, resources and give back. You don't have right. to be a, cl a clinician to do that. And right. Obviously, you're doing amazing work. So how long did you work for um, at your agency as a training coordinator before you got your degree and decided to have that lunch and learn? Had you been there for a while? Or? So I really only worked there almost four years total. Mm -hmm. and, and I got my degree right at the beginning of it. So again, I wasn't there to provide, I wasn't the wellness coordinator. I was bringing, I was bringing in speakers for tactical stuff and, and investigative stuff, blood spatter analysis, you know, all of these things that they need. And, and it wasn't really wellness focused. And I wasn't really because I just didn't connect the two so much at the time. So I did very little there really just the kind of the, the brown bugs and stuff. And then I went on to um, do other, you know, other things for about a year and, and started building this. And so there was this little transitional thing. It was weird. I worked at the FAA doing training, but it was just a really good opportunity that I it was, it was about double the pay. Let me just say that. So I did, wow. I went and did that, but I hated it. It was technical training, teaching software step-by-step, step, push this button, then push that button. It was not, that is again, not my thing. So I have finally found, um, you know, five or six years ago, found this and found what I really love, what I'm passionate about, what I genuinely care about, which is first responders. Um, so again, of course I started with law enforcement, but then and learned more and more and expanded more and connected more with all the responder disciplines, but 
Um, so that was just kind of the, the kickoff, the catalyst, the starting point for something that has grown that I've, that I've actually made it grow because I love it so much. So I just have, have, I just jumped in really with both feet and said, this is what I love. This is what I'm going to do. And just sort of, I didn't even know what it was going to be that I, I didn't know it was going to run a company. I just wanted to put some training online, you know, and it's turned into this whole thing, but I'm glad it has. Yeah. And so are we, because there are so many first responders that are benefiting because, and I know you're going to get into this, but, um, with Academy Hour, I think you said earlier this year, you were able to finally offer online training for first responders free of charge. Free. No cost whatsoever. That's yeah, so amazing. For, for three years, we had this catalog and I created these classes. You know, there's a class on anxiety and stress and burnout. There's a class on PTSD. And there's, I think we have almost 50 classes total. There's like 150 training hours total on there. So you go on there and you click a class on... Um, I don't know, debriefing, and it's a two-hour class, and it's free. Yeah, and so January 1st this year, we took all the pricing off and just and said, you guys could get this, just take this training. I, I don't want to charge for it. I don't want responders to have to, I don't want there to be any obstacle to them getting these resources and this training. And this Because what I was finding that is someone won't go to a counselor because they have PTSD or they think they have PTSD. They can sit and watch training. They're allowed to watch training. They're encouraged to watch training. And so if you can watch a class and learn all the stuff about PTSD, you're going to, you're more likely to understand yourself and the things you're going through. Why would I charge someone to get that, that, you know what I mean? Like I just, once I was able to, to, um, fund my company, I guess, in other ways, um, then I was like, I, I don't want them having to pay for this. I just want them to be able to get this education. And what a noble goal for you to want to have, to be able to provide that. Thanks. I love it. I just really, my goal is to, if I could give everything away for free, if I didn't have to support myself, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, or pay my staff, like if everybody would just work for free, I would love it because I would love to just get it all out there and not have, not have to charge for it. But the responders, I mean, I charge the clinician program. I charge for the peer support program that departments typically pay for. Um, but that's people are getting certifications from that, that help themselves and so forth. The peer, the, the, the first responders that are taking mental health training, they're not, their careers aren't benefiting from them having checked that box or have that certificate on their wall. They took a training to understand anxiety or they took a training class to understand PTSD. That's, that's, there's no way I would feel right continuing to, to be like, well, I could charge for it, so I'm going to. And so I just want them to be able to get, get that information. I don't know how else to explain it. I just want to be able to, under, to gain an understanding in whatever way I can do. Well, and what a way to streamline getting this information to people, because I know when I went through the academy 25 years ago, we didn't talk about this kind of stuff. Right. We didn't have this information. And now if your agency doesn't have a wellness program or doesn't have training like this, this is just a resource. Like there's, right. there's no excuse. I mean, right. the only, I guess the only, the only barrier I see is like agencies not knowing that you exist. Right. Because why would you not allow your people to sign up for free to get this information? Right. And the other benefit is they don't have to go through their department. You're a person and you go to academyr.com on the catalog, you click on it, you take the class. No one has to know <laughs> that you took a suicide prevention class. You know what I mean? It's not going to be reported to anybody. Your HR department isn't going to be like, you logged on and took a suicide prevention class? Yeah, I took training. How did you, you know, they, they don't have to know. It's training. Like, take the training. It's not counseling. It's learning some information. It's, you know, everybody can, be, you can't have too much knowledge. You yeah. Just, and we know. will, we will definitely make sure to share all those resources and the links so people can sign up. But can you tell us a little bit more? You mentioned very briefly, you had peer support training. And then earlier you and I discussed before we, we hit record, how you also have um, a clinician counseling, or if I'm saying this right, <laughs> I'll let you explain it. You know what I'm, what I'm asking. So yeah. could you tell everybody about that? Yeah, so the, the two programs, um, one is, uh, well, so I had the Academy Hour, I have to do a little history of it here, the, the Academy Hour online training was all we had. As I was working personally, and I teach in person too, so I would go teach at departments and teach and so forth, um, and so I'd always get, you know, I say guys, guys and gals come up and talk at break when be like, oh, so I had this my trauma or whatever, and they always tell you, you know, I'm like, you should, you should see counselors. I was telling them as I was working so I worked really closely with the, the SWAT team here in my county where I worked, where I live. Um, and, and they would, they, I gained trust, which is really hard to do. So I feel 
honored um, to, that, that they trust me to tell me their stories and things. But they would come to, and I go on ride alongs like every chance I get. And, and I get people talking in that, that environment, that two people in the car kind of thing, telling me stories. And I'm like, you really, you really would benefit from counseling. And I'd hear them going, yeah, well, we have an EAP. And I'm like, your EAP. I'm so, I was so naive at the time. I'm like, you know, go to your EAP that you get three sessions for free. And they're like, I'm not going to those people. You know, I was like, why? They, they mean well, they are their counselors. And, and it took me a while to, I was going to take me a while, but it took me hearing the stories to figure out they don't want to go to counselors because the counselors would be like, what? You saw what? And they're, and the counselors were, were saying, oh, I, you need to get a different counselor because you told me this story last week that's really been haunting me. And I just can't hear those kinds of things. And I had one say, um, I have I used the clip of it on my training that said, um, next time you come, if you're going to tell me one of these really hard stories, I need you to forewarn me first because, you know, I'm just a civilian. I, I don't hear And I was like, oh, my God, you're going to be kidding. Mm, yeah. So. So we created this. So I was looking for them. I was like, okay, how do I find counselors that that get these guys, that get the cops and and their culture and their they wouldn't let them bring, they, you know, they tell me stories like the the counselor wouldn't let me take my firearm and they wanted me to leave it in the car. And I'm like, what? Think it, you're, but what? <laughs> you know? And they're like, I don't want to leave it in my car. I'm like, no, you don't leave it in your car. Like, of course you need to be able to wear that into the. It's you. It's part of you. Like it's an appendage. Like what are they? Yeah, it scared them. They didn't like the firearm. I was like, oh my gosh, let's find you a better counselor. And so I'd look, and I look, and I couldn't find, or, or they didn't want to hear the stories, or the, they said, look, if you would please watch your language during our counseling. Oh, fuck, really? Like, <laughs> oh boy. So I was like, you don't get it at all. <laughs> so I, I looked, and I was trying to find, where do I find counselors? Where do I find counselors? They get, and they're just, there was this big gap. So I was like, I'm in the perfect position. I'm a trainer. I have an online platform. I know counseling. I know law enforcement. So we developed the certified, let's see if I can even say, certified first responder counselor program. So clinicians could go through this program and, and learn the, the culture, learn cop culture, learn for fire, fire and EMS and just first responder culture, that they are going to cuss in, their, in your office. They are going to tell you really bad scenes, incidents. They're going to tell you about that and they're going to describe it you know, at first point of view, as they walked in the room and they saw blank, they're going to say that to you and they, they don't need to filter that. They, they don't want to have to worry about trauma. It's the reason they don't go talk to their spouses. They don't want to walk in and dump it on you and traumatize you, you know? And so I, I look, I get all like bent. Um, so we developed this program and it's not just a training program. It's a vetting program because I don't want any of them saying, hey, I think it'd be cool to see responders. I want to see some clients. I want them, they go through this, it's 50 hours total training hours. Um, they're required to go on a ride along as part of it. And then I encourage them to go on ride alongs forever. Um, the required, there's one book reading, they, Gil Martin's book is part of it. But because um, I think it's so important. And there's, I did an interview with Gil Martin on there that's, that's really, really lovely. I love it. But, um, so I, I put trauma stories in there and I'm like, this is the kind of story there's segments interspersed throughout the training called stories you will hear. And it is either a video of a responder as if he's the counselor client telling a really, really hard trauma story, or it's videos that I've taken from documentaries that are firsthand from the responder point of view, responding to a difficult scene, um, hearing a story. It's all, I want them to really be experientially exposed i don't know if that's a but to to the actual reality of what responders go through and what they will need to come not necessarily what they would come into the office telling but what they should be able to come into the office talking about without being um cut off because the story is too difficult i want them to understand the poor coping skills that are normal for a responder which is the excessive drinking the the anger, the all of these things, infidelity, like all the things that are, so that, so that if you had a civilian come in and be like, I've been cheating on my spouse and, and my girlfriend, and I drink a fifth of whiskey every night, and and, and the, the counselor's going to go, holy crap, oh, you've got big problems. Instead, you're going to see a responder and go, okay, yeah, you and all your buddies, let's let's help you. Let's get you some, you know what I mean? Like, let's talk through it. This, these are typical coping responses. They're not good. They're not healthy. I don't want you to continue them, but I'm not going to freak out and call your department and be like, oh my God, this guy's angry. Yeah, he's angry because 
the stuff he sees, you know? So I want them to understand the correct level of when to react to something they've said or how to not freak out because of the stories that they're going to hear and to know also as a counselor to a responder, you're going to get vicarious trauma and you're going to need to have a counselor in place to talk through that with. And so I teach all like all of it in there so that we now have counselors that can actually see responders and, and be helpful to them. So I just want to make sure people understand like the magnitude of, of what you just explained, because ev well, everything that you just said are all the things that I have heard myself from people about why they will not go see a counselor in okay. the past. Right. I think it's changing. So I think it's incredible really that you're, this is not 50 hours of a PowerPoint that oh, no. you're, <laughs> yeah, that you are inserting like all the different things that you talked about. Because you're right. I mean, to hear people say how much they're drinking and just the conversations that you're going to hear from cop culture or first right. resp responder culture, it's understandable that most people aren't used to hearing that. Right. And so just educating them and letting them know what they're getting into. Because I assume when you've got people in your training, maybe some of them haven't yet worked with first responders and maybe right. they're thinking of it. So this will prepare them. And I'm assuming there are some people that are be like, mm, maybe I don't want to do this. <laughs> well, interesting you say that because we have, I start out the program very clearly saying you've signed up for this training in, and thank you for investing this training and wanting to help this population. But this is not for every counselor. This is not for everyone. Just like the responder career is not for everyone. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't be a cop. There's no way you could get me to do this, especially now. But you know, I, I, were five, I would run into a burning building. I'm running the other direction. You know what I mean? It's, it's being a counselor to this population is also not for everyone. And I stress it very hard and very frequently throughout this training. And we get about a 50% graduation rate. Mm. And that's because, and I get emails from some of the counselors going, okay, no, I'm on session five and I don't want to do any more. I don't even want to watch any more of this training because it's too hard. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you for, for, for realizing that and acknowledging that and not, going, eh, I'm going to see them anyway. Don't, they just don't. It's literally 50%. Like the 320 people or whatever we have that have graduated now is 50% of the people that had enrolled thinking they wanted to do it. The other 50% decided it just wasn't for them. So I'm glad. I want it to be a vetting program as well as a training program. If I had 100% people graduate, I'm doing something wrong. They all think they're equipped for it. And it, as much as I would love to equip them for it, I would rather... The people that really aren't right for it know that they're not right and don't do it. Yeah, no, I that's encouraging to hear that feedback about that because we certainly don't want people out there claiming that they're trained, quote unquote, to see first responders when their heart's really not in it and they right. know that they're not cut out for it. Right. No, I make it really intense. I think oh for lack of work. I, I mean it's it's again, it was hard to it was hard for me to create the training, some of the video because I watched, you know. 10 times more than I put in the training and it, and it's, it's trauma. And I, and, I, and the, the program content is released gradually. They can't binge watch. Um, it's 50 hours released, you know, a little bit every day and they can't move on to the next one until the next day because I need them to process one for educational, for retention purposes. But, but two, there's one session that's complete, that, that's, that's more intense and difficult than others. And I leave them a day in between that they don't get the next, they don't get content the next day because I think it's going to be harder to process and I want them to take the time to do that. I don't want to traumatize them during the training, although they get that warning. These are traumatizing stories. I want them to take the time to, to process it before going on to the next, the next story, the next lesson, the next whatever. They, they can't binge watch it. They're just not allowed to sit and go, hey, I have a week off. I'm going to take this trip. Mm -mm, doesn't work that way. Like it takes 50 days for them to get the entire content. Mm. So, well, and I, I, I have a friend here locally who's a clinician and she sees, I would say about at least half, um, of her clients are first responders. And she says the other half are other clinicians. And I'm sure. It, it, yeah. <laughs> and you told me, you mentioned it earlier. You said that you really encourage a therapist, a clinician to have one pretty much for the rest of their career. We're taught during counseling school that you should have your own, you can't just take in trauma and, and stories and even not even just trauma, but just like responders, not all of the stuff you experience on the job is trauma. A lot of it's just a lot of negative crap, you know, and, and, and when you're taking a negative, 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 negative and negative interactions and pain in the butt people and 
it, it's, it affects you. It changes your worldview. It changes your brain chemistry. And you have to have an outlet for that. So the counselors that even just see, like, and I just say just see, it's, I'm not minimizing people that do um, other kinds of therapy or have other populations, because I think it's all hard, obviously. Um, but you have to have an outlet for that. Um, no different than people ask me a lot of times, like, should I go home? Should I be going home and telling my spouse about my day? If your spouse has an outlet, because otherwise you're dumping and you're filling up that person's bucket of trauma and they don't have anywhere to take it and they're they're not only now picturing it and worrying you about you in those situations but they're they have that vicarious trauma you have to go to couples counseling for the things that you see as a responder or whatever like that there are there are ways to approach that and ways to do it but if you're only in taking trauma and you don't have any outlet you're that it's gonna fill up at some point so every counselor is supposed to already have a counselor but a first responder tra especially a trauma counselor has got to have somewhere to to get their own healing and their own processing for all of that. Well, I'm really glad you emphasize that because it makes so much sense. You're taking care of people. You need right. to take care of yourself. Just same just with like responders. Any, <laughs> right. Just like any frontline worker. It, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. right. And so there are different tiers to this training too, right? Yes. So yeah. So we started out with just this clinician training because it's called the cert. It is a certification, meaning you've taken training, you've proven yourself to have learned the, the content via an exam. And um, it's called a certified first responder counselor. I don't want to, anybody can go through it. And you can go online and pay for it and go through it, but you cannot take the exam and be certified unless you are a fully licensed clinician. And, and that's not even someone who's still in supervision under supervision hours who they're out there practicing and they are clinician, but I need to not certify someone as a counselor who's state or, or, you know, licensing board isn't quite ready to do that for whatever reason um so i said so, but i had a treatment facility this the guy that runs it is really great because it's a responder facility in california who said i have a lot of other people who work here that work with the responders who aren't clinicians i want to put them through it i want them to have the same cultural awareness and cultural competency but they're not clinicians and i said i can't i'm not putting them through that but but i tell you what we'll do is well, and so the, he was great, and, and the catalyst for me creating two new tiers. One of them is a CFRA, Certified First Responder Associate, and the other is a Certified First Responder Supporter. Um, the associate is for anybody in some sort of counseling type of role. So it just it's basically the same 50 hours of content minus 10, which is the stuff like um, documentation and reporting and, and the things that clinicians that are relevant strictly to licensed clinicians but the rest of it is understanding the culture. It's the same stories you will hear. It's the same exposure to all the stuff. It's explain the same explanation of why they respond and act the way they do. Um, the the bad coping mechanisms, how you can help them in whatever your whether you're a chaplain, and that's a counseling role or a group facilitator. You may be leading a group without being an actual licensed clinician or whatever, just to understand. So there's the associate level, and then there's the supporter. Because this guy has like resident in California, they have these residential treatment facilities that's not just like a hospital residential, it's like a home, it's a house basically. And they have six bed max, but they have a cook um, this, that cooks all the meals for the people that's in the kitchen of a house. So think about somebody in your house, in your kitchen, you're going to interact with them. Sure. Yeah. And then they have them driving them to appointments. So they have drivers um and receptionist and all these people he said i want them all to know the same thing if they're in the car driving the responder to an appointment i need them to not say the wrong thing or not react incorrect i need them all to know the same thing so we developed this it's just a 20-hour program um and it's a high you know much higher level of competency but but understanding the culture so that if he's in there talking to the cook you know some responders and they're talking to the cook and says something the cook has a bit of an understanding and and won't be like holy crap man why are you cussing so much why are you telling me that they're in treatment like they should be able to not watch what they're saying they need to you know they're, they're there to heal and to learn and so that's why we did it this guy was the was a, it was a great idea um and so we created these two other levels for anybody so anybody at all can go through the supporter we're actually working on one that is made for the general public um just not not this necessarily even choosing to work with responders, but maybe even purposely doesn't want to work, doesn't like responders, doesn't like the cops. We're we're making a 
public education program to understand things that the public doesn't understand. You know, just, and I'm talking basic things like, I'm ranting here, but the, the basic things like when I, before I started in this work, if I got pulled over for going six miles over the speed limit, I'd be like, don't you have anything better to do? You know, that can't, aren't there's people killing each other out there. I didn't understand even at the time, the basic things like there's patrol, there's traffic cops. That's what they do. They're not homicide investigators. You know what I mean? They're not detectives. That is their job is to stop people from breaking traffic laws. And, and, and so when you say, don't you have anything better to do than, you know, there's people kill Yeah. That's not my, that's not my lane. Like, this is what I do. I'm here to make sure you obey the law. And so it's just, it's just stuff that makes things the general public doesn't understand about what the jobs do, what you yelling at a cop does to him as a person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. just that sort of thing. So that was a long, long ass explanation of why. We- no, no, no. It was great. It was great. No, I, I love it. No, it's, it's awesome. And, and I really like what you're working on because you're, you know, I've got the wheels are turning as you're talking because we have citizens police academies that right. we do at our right. agency. And what a great module to be able to like infuse into the citizens police academy. I and mean, when we touch upon that kind of stuff, but it sounds like what you're working on is a, a little bit more in depth. For it's sure. education for sure. Citizens academies are fantastic. And I've been through a couple of them just as was, was part of my learning process. They're great because you're trying to build rapport. The thing about citizens academies, people are voluntarily sign up for that because they're like, this would be cool. I want to learn more. What about the people who are like, I'm a, I don't want anything to, I don't want to understand them. They need to, whatever, somehow we can get this, this awareness and the education of what it really means to be a cop and, and how much a cop has to learn or a paramedic, even like how much medical knowledge a fire, a firefighter has. They, I mean, that is a lot. They don't, firefighting is this, you know, small portion of what they have to know. And the medical knowledge that a firefighter has is ridiculous. The law that a law enforcement officer has to have knowledge of, the legal system and actual laws and statutes and so forth, they have to know so much. People don't know that. People don't understand that. They don't, you know, I think there's just so much that is lacking in the, in the public. This is a whole different rant on its own, but there's so much <laughs> that is missing in the public understanding of what law enforcement specifically, why they do what they do why they put their knee a certain place to restrain somebody because somebody or the danger that they they have to anticipate someone they have to err on the side of caution they have to treat you like you might be violent because so many times they people have been and if you're not aware you're not prepared you're going to get hurt or killed in the line of duty and and you have they have to approach people a certain way if the if the public would just understand that i think it would change so many things and I can't do that by myself, but I can at least do my part, you know, and, and just if it's out there, at least it's out there and available. And if we can get people to go through it in however we do, I don't even know, but how to get people to actually sign up for it once I do it. But uh, if you don't care, you don't care. If you don't want to know, you don't want to know, but, but it'll be there. And I, I just think so much could change if we, if we, if we all gained an understanding of each other and looked at each other and wanting to learn the why behind all sorts of things, but both sides. I mean, I'm, I'm not ch- choosing sides or anything else, but I know my side, I know what I know and the people I work with, and that's where I can educate, um, you know, if every culture to understand every culture. I just think understanding is the bottom line that we're missing right now. Yeah. And what a tremendous value that is. Like you said, you can't force people to go through the training, but if you create it and it's there eventually, you know, if you get it, to the right people. And then you have people that are, you know, your champions that right, are, you know, right. all over the country can, that, that are maybe in these agencies that can talk to different citizens groups, not just the citizen police Academy, but I see right. just like our community policing officers right. going out to these advisory board meetings and people yeah. that interact with different segments of the community, just right. being able to spread that information would yeah. be, is, is a really, a really big value. Cause if you don't know something, you, you, um, Yes. You make assumptions. That's the word I was trying to go. Right. If you do not know something about someone or some situation, you make an assumption based on your own experiences. And that's dangerous for both sides, for any side. That's dangerous. I say both sides. There's so many sides. There's just, that's just dangerous. I don't think any of us should make any assumptions about anybody else. 
and we should all be educated before we have any say in anything. Yeah. And I mean, this is kind of a more lighthearted example, but I'm guilty of it too. When it comes to firefighters, I know we always joke about cops and firefighters, but over the last, (laughs) that's right. But over the last few years in all seriousness, and it's mostly because of doing peer support and working with, you know, other agencies, like I have a a newfound respect. I did just kind of think, okay, they sit around, they eat dinner, they They cook, they they go fight a fire, they go to the Y, you know, whatever. But, but like you said, you touched upon it earlier when you talked about how much knowledge and how much training they really do have. I mean, it, yeah. it really is mind blowing when you, when you really realize that. So it is. And if you see video, I have a, a, one of my very best friends just retired after 35 years as a firefighter and he, in all the time I've known him, he's never told me the stories and everything. And he was one of those old school, don't talk about it, whatever, but he just retired and he started sharing some mm-hmm. retirement's been very hard. Um, but but show me some videos like body cam videos firefighters there did you know <laughs> that is gonna sound so stupid but you, they walk into a burning building and it's dark it's <laughs> like they can't see anything he goes I'm gonna take you he was here he was like I'm gonna go to your next door neighbor's house I'm gonna tell them to turn out all the lights tonight and I'm gonna send you in there and say uh, I I have put a stuffed animal in the corner somewhere in this house go find it. And I was like, well, I don't know my way around this house. And he's like, nope. And I was like, you're not going to give me a flashlight? And he's like, nope. And he's like, oh, and I'm going to turn, and I'm going to start the house on fire. The roof might fall on you, so hurry. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, they, I mean, just the firefighting aspect of it, you're in someone's house. And he said he got trapped in a bathroom one time and couldn't find his way out. Like it was, it, he couldn't find it, couldn't figure out based on all the noise and the confusion and the smoke and the dark where the door, like I was like, I would freak the heck out. And, yeah. and, you know, and then all the medical knowledge, it is unbelievable. But, but law enforcement, it is. too. Like, all yeah. the stuff you have to know is ridiculous. Well, let me let me just, like, chime in for a minute about what you just said. So, last week, and I don't know if you've heard about yoga for first responders yeah, before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I first got trained five years ago, but last year, or sorry, last week, we had to train the trainer. So, more people at our agency and local first responders could, could get trained and, and teach this. It's Olivia Mead, right? So, yeah, Olivia. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So, five years ago, we did not do this in our training. It's come so far. The training is amazing. And so, just listen to this. You made me think of this. Okay. So, not a firefighter. Right. What we do is, well, what they do in the training is they apply how yoga can be beneficial when you're out doing your job. Makes sense, right? So right. we had law enforcement teaching tax skills and firearms, which, you know, I, I get that. I'm not, I got to do it. That, that clicks with me. But what I wasn't aware of is what firefighters do. And so one of the drills was being blindfolded and having to search on the, it was a search and rescue drill. And I don't really want to give it away because I think people who come to the training need to experience it, but it was practical application right. of what you're going to do on the job and how the, the things that you're learning in this training are going to be able to help you perform better. Right. And then another thing, and, and there was like kind of a picture of this on the news, the news came out and did a story that they had us go through a yoga class blind with, with your mouth covered and you had a blindfold on because like you just said, you're going to have to go into these situations. Mass, you can't see, you fear. have all this equipment on, right. And being able to train your nervous system um, to feel what it's going to be like and how you're going to handle it. So, right. so anyhow, just. I love just, the yoga for first responders. Yeah. Libby Mead. So she's, we have part of her, she did a little clip that's part of our counselor training. Um, because I promote that as I also promote in the program, know what resources to send your responder clients to. Mm -hmm. Um, yoga. So I love how she describes it is, you know, the ability to focus, the ability to, you know, that's what yoga I used to, I kind of say when I teach classes, like I used to think yoga and meditation were like fluffy, super, like, like I, I didn't want to be the fluffy mental health lady. I wanted to be realistic and, and, and bottom line and I'm real bottom line anyway, but which is why I probably like responders. Like they're not, I don't like, let's sit in a circle and here, hold this teddy bear and tell me about your feelings and pretend that it's no, like never. (laughs) So when I heard yoga and, and meditation, I was like, oh my God, like these are for, these are fluffy things. No one's going to do this. She changed the culture of that content, content, you know, Olivia did. And so I give her kudos for that. But it, but she does talk about how it changes your ability to, to focus on what you need to focus on, to calm your, your anxiety and your physiological responses to just adrenaline and, and really be 
present and aware of the things you need to be present and aware of in that moment when your life is at stake and other lives are at stake and there's chaos all around you. Like it does so many things for you. I can't, I can't say enough good things about that initiative and that, and what it does. Like I, in meditation, there's a firefighter in Anaheim named Maddie Fiorenza. And I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's big on social no. media, but um, he's been through a lot of trauma. He's a fire, a current firefighter, but, um, and he's part of a program called Save a Warrior, S-A-W, SAW is what they call it. But, um, but he, he does, he's big into meditation and he talks about how it, it's restorative. Like it gets you, you know, especially if you've had trauma and you've been healing from trauma, it's so meditation and yoga together, like you, your focus on the job will improve so much. Your ability to tune out the chaos and the, the, the chaos, like I say, the people yelling and cussing and all the stuff while you're trying to achieve a mission and focus on your task at hand, I don't, it should be part of academy training as well the mental health but i think yoga and meditation should be like this is going to benefit you in so many ways it's a hard sell because it does seem fluffy and you know but it's it is so beneficial to your overall well-being and your ability to just be where you need to be yeah and i know you already know this if you know olivia but the preconceived notion and the stigma that people associate the word yoga with is yeah. is is the first barrier yeah um, but i think yeah. once you can get people past that and into a class and even just give them a little bit of education mm -hmm. and say, this is exactly what is happening when you practice this breathing right. technique. Right. And this is how it can too. help you. That, it, exactly. That, just saying the word people are like, Oh yeah, I don't need that. Yeah. You right. do. Why would you not do everything that will benefit you and help you be better? Why would you not jump on board with anything that is going to help you be better and healthier and feel better and do better? Yeah. And fortunately, you know, at the agency I'm at, we do teach recruits and it is in the academy. Now, I'd like to see it more ingrained, but at least mm -hmm. they get some of it right now. Right. So couldn't agree more. So, yeah, you can get me talking about yoga and meditation and I can talk about that forever. Awesome. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned academy. We're, we're developing a program and it's not I kind of hate to put it out there because I've had some people like copying a bunch of stuff I do. But um it's called ceasefire training it, there's a website where i've basically drawn up the the kind of what it's going to be about but it's for it's a train the trainer for academy instructors police and fire um to teach a three-day block on mental health this is what the career will do to you this is how it will affect you this is how to avoid it this is how to be preventative this is how to live a better life this is how to be ready when you retire without giving up your entire identity this is like it's three days of how to take care of yourself throughout your career what it might do to you, what it looks like, what it's going to look like in your peers, how to, I mean, it's everything. They teach everything in the, in Academy, but that. And so we've, that's, a, that's the, another one of those where I saw a gap and I was like, why isn't anybody teaching? So we've created it, train the trainer. So I'm not going to go around teaching it. It'll be train the Academy instructors that the, that the cadets are already listening to and already trusting throughout the Academy, train them about the mental health. Um, so they can teach the block, but also they'll know enough to kind of interject it in their other training when they're teaching it in the academy. So will that training also encompass um, retirement? Because I know you said something about police identity, but really getting people ready, because that's that is a gap that I yes. see that I've, yes. I, I've, I've often thought about what can we do and it's, how it's can we create something. It's a huge initiative of mine. Yeah. So that's gonna, awesome. because you have to start, you know, people people live their whole lives or have lived their whole lives preparing for retirement. I'm gonna work 30 years in, in a normal, like a corporate environment and, and for retirement. And I'm gonna, and when I retire, I'll do this. And when I retire, I'll do that. And there's so much pressure on your retirement rather than on living a good life all the way through. And so that's part of it is don't make it your entire identity. Don't make all your friends only cops. Don't, or what, you know, fellow responders make, and, and also have a plan for your retirement um, like I said, I have this firefighter friend who's 35 years in, um, it's all he's known. And he literally the day before his retirement was already freaking out, didn't want to retire, ended up having to medically retire. Um, but he's, he's of retirement age, so he should be thinking about it anyway. But he, he was like sitting on my couch going, I have no purpose. I have, and I was like, you're losing your connection. You're losing everything when you retire because you don't have anything else. You like, you screwed this up. You know, I was like, you need to have planned better. 
I that has to be taught at the at the rookie level and continuously taught all throughout the career. Every training needs to be not necessarily. I mean, it, it definitely focusing on retirement, but also focusing on balance, um, counterbalancing all the negative in the in the career, but also balancing just the fact that this is your career. You're still a person. You still are allowed to have emotions. You're still allowed to have family. You got to take care of your family. You can't just ignore your family for the career. It's it's all of it encompassing. But then when you retire, you retire happy and well and healthy and ready to do the next thing, not jump back into another law enforcement career at a different agency and earn another retirement just because that's all you know and you don't want to lose it. Yeah. Got to be actually like, so we are, we're actually developing, Academy is actually developing a retiree program because I just kept seeing, I kept thinking, God, they've got, they've got so much wisdom. They got so much experience. And then they just cut off from everything. We, I'm trying to have, so we're starting it to have retirees create courses for us and then be mentors. We're going to have like a mentorship program because they have so much to offer. And in my peer support program, I'm like, include retirees in your peer support program because they, they've learned hard lessons. Don't just kick them out the door and never use their experience again. Like get them some healing and bring them back in to, to, to just be so benefit. They're so, they're, they just have so much to offer. And, and they just have learned so much. And if they're willing to be open to mental health, because because a lot of them are the old crusty guys who they're like, well, I was fine without this. And I'm like, yeah, how many times have you been married? How much do you drink? How's your financial situation? <laughs> you know, like, and they're like, okay, yeah, all right. So, but, you know, if we can, if we can use the, use the retirees to benefit the younger ones and give, give the retirees continued purpose and continued connection everybody wins. I just think it's just got to be a normal thing. I'm so glad you're doing that because, you know, I was smiling. People can't see that I was smiling, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's like all the things that you're saying are the things that, that I know to be true. And I've seen it, you know, with the people that I work with, it's like, you know, we have, we have a peer support team and we have people that are retirees on the team for all the reasons uh, that you just yeah. mentioned. And then our wellness program, really trying to stay connected mm -hmm. with those people who leave. Because like you said, the institutional knowledge that walks out the door, it, it's it's almost like a shame that we yeah, don't it is a shame. try to, to do something to try to keep those people. Now, I know a lot of times, unfortunately, when people leave, they are ready. They're like done. They're done. They, They've, they don't they've want tolerated the last 10 right. years. Yeah. Yes. So we're which doing is it right. That won't be the case anymore. Exactly. You know what I mean? Right. And I just love how you're, you're bringing that all in because I had Dan Willis on my show and yeah. I think he well, teaches one of your classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he, I love the way he put it. He said, you know, we all get into these professions because we want to feel useful in right. some way. And that just doesn't go away when you retire. You and need so a purpose. just You've exactly have a purpose. You know, yeah. I do a lot of work with suicide prevention, Blue Help, and the and the survivors of blue suicide that was come off of the cops, um, concerns of police, police survivors. That you know, they talk about the numbers, the statistics um, of suicides in law enforcement, and a lot of it is like, oh, the week after they retired, like what? They they waited and waited and waited, and they tolerated and they stood everything they could, and then they got out. Then then they could, like because they need they lose connection. They have to show their badge to get in the door of the place that they were a, was their brotherhood and their family a week before. They lose connection. They lose purpose. They don't, not just getting up in the morning and going, what am I going to do today? But an overall general purpose in their life is to to do this and to serve this, this need, this career. And it just stops. And nobody, there's no transition. There's no, okay, we're going to, we would love for you to teach for us. We'd love for you to, to be a mentor in our department. All of the things that could give them purpose. And if, if we're treating them right throughout their careers, they won't be at that, oh my God, I've just got to get out of here. Please never call me point. They would be like the normal thing is, okay, now I am um, in career slash post career. Not, not retired, but um, mentor. now I'm in the mentor stage, you know, of leading. There's the, there's the, I used, when I worked at the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, I created a leadership program and we used the Eagles as kind of um, the thing and it was Eaglet. So somebody that was just starting the leadership program, then we had like, there was like four phases and you were the Eagle when you were like in the midst of it. And then you were the, um, I can't remember what it was called, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the old Eagle that was like then mentoring the Eaglets, you know, like you had a phase, you weren't done, you weren't out, you didn't lose right. purpose, you didn't lose, you were you were then like, okay, you've actually been through your whole career. 
we've we've trained you through your 20 or 30, 40 year career so that you can now be what you were intended to be, which is the mentor. Like it's the goal rather than the the letdown. You know, the goal is to, okay, I've spent my entire career learning so that I could now help people and I'm going to help my brothers, the younger brothers, but I'm going to help them. Well, I can't wait for that curriculum to, to be put together because I know that we'll be checking it out for sure. Awesome. awesome. I get excited about like the new, like, I'm like yeah, I'm going to make that. So it won't be too long. Yeah, I can. I, I, I mean, people can't see you, but they could probably feel the enthusiasm. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can tell. Uh, I'm never quite sure what that means. Everybody's like, so I see you're really passionate about this. I'm like, oh, I need to calm down. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. It's <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I remember, that's what I always get. Oh, I see you're passionate about this. I'm like, oh, I was really obnoxious. All right. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. So I don't want us to forget to talk about some other training that you already have online, which is peer support training. Can you just tell everybody a little bit about that? Yeah. Again, I was, it's, it's where I saw a need, um, because of COVID, I guess possibly, possibly was what, what was the impetus, but, um, you know, classes got shut down. People couldn't go to onsite classes. Well, I run an online platform. So that's, that's what I, I was like, Hey, I can fix that problem. Um, so peer support. There is, there's peer support training and there's great peer support training. And I never, ever want to say, go to my training instead of blank, unless it's a bad training out there somewhere. But I don't want to say like, if somebody says, should we do this or should we do, let's say SISM with ICSF, for example, do both, like learn everything you possibly can, all the angles you can to be a better peer support team person. So, and whatever you have to do, but, but we developed an online version because that's what we do. And so it helps with staffing. They can take it a little. It's, again, gradual release over a little bit of time, not quite as intense as the counselor program. But um, you don't have to send 10 people in your department to a class for a week. Like, it's online. So you can fit a little bit. So do Watch it while you're drinking your coffee in the morning while you're starting up. Do it as a roll call training. Show, show 20 minutes of it. Whatever you have to do in the mornings, like beginning, whatever you do, however you fit it in. But each person individually does their own training. So you don't even have to do it all at the same time. It's what works for you today, what works for you tomorrow, whatever. Um, And so it's peer support, but we did the teammate. So everyone on the team. And then we have the team leader. Um, The team leader, so it's basically a 24-hour training, but then the team leader gets uh, six extra hours. So it's 30 hours for them. And that's all specifically focused on how to lead a team, how to lead a peer support team. You get a lot of people in peer support who are assigned peer support because maybe they're the person people go to to talk and their chief was like, you'd be great at peer support. Why don't you start a team? They don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. Our training walks them through how to start a team, how to select the right team teammates, how to train the right teammates, how to monitor them, how to um, take care of them and yourself. But also sometimes people are, are peer support leaders, team leaders who've never been in charge of anybody. They've never supervised, they've never supervised a team or a mission or anything. And and they're like, I, now I'm also leading a team of volunteers to do something really super important. I don't know. So we walk them through all of that. We also teach a lot about, um, it's not just debriefing, it's about trauma. It's about what to look for, what it looks like, what it does to you, how it affects you, how you need to care for yourself and take care of yourself in order to be able to serve other people as a peer support teammate. Um, suicide prevention, how to talk to somebody who's in crisis, um, what it, what their families may be going through and how to work with their families. And I mean, it's, it's all of it. It's, it's everything you might need to know. It's, you might be helping the, the spouse, um, plan a funeral. Like here's what to do. Here's what they might, you might need to go pick up their kids for them, help them in your support. However you might support somebody, these are the different ways you can do it. So we talk all through that, um, how to coordinate hospital visits and it shifts and that sort of thing um, with volunteers, how to not just rely on the peer support team, but the rest of the department personnel for things for like that. Somebody needs to drive or somebody needs to, how to fund a peer support team. Um, when you don't have uh, help from uh, um, support from administration, how to still have peer support, even if you can't officially have a peer support team, like it's, it's a lot of stuff. So um it's really just to kind of, again, fill that gap. We, we were having people not be able to build support teams because they couldn't go to training or for whatever reason. So it's online. Um, but it's also 
we believe very strongly, I believe very strongly in certifications just because like the clinicians, I don't want them just to go through the training once and then there you go, go be, go lead peer support and never touch base back. I want them to have that sense of accomplishment. You earned this because you took this training, you passed an exam, we have a requirement of you. Um, every year you have to renew to, to hold this, to maintain this designation, but also you have to take CE. Like I want you to come back every year and let me teach you some more and, and refresh your training. And this year, this particular topic is really hard. And so we have a class on that to help you in your peer support role. And so I require that of the clinicians and I require the peer support because I just think the ongoing one, we support them. They, that we support them in their role as peer support, but we also educate and train them. They get a challenge coin when they re, when they graduate. We mail them a congratulations card and a challenge coin. Um, and we continuously, like, they have an online community. So the clinicians do too, but we have a, a setup when you graduate from our program. You There's an online community and you're connected with peer support teammates who have graduated from the program all over the country. And you can go on and post a question um, the leaders have their own community. So they can say, leading my team is hard because I've got this challenge or this obstacle or this person or what, you know, it's usually a person. So <laughs> this is making things more difficult. And so they go on there and they can ask questions of other people who are in peer support roles and they can have those conversations online and communi community, I guess, it's one bigger community. They're not just relying on their own peer support team or their own leadership or whatever, it becomes part of a bigger thing. Um, and we've just started online support groups where our clinicians are now running first responder only online Zoom support groups. Um, those are starting August 1st. So, so the peer support team has someone to refer their peers to be like, here's clinician, but also here's some online support groups and it's responders only. There's not going to be civilians in there and it's national. So it's probably not going to be someone from your own department. Like it's, somebody you don't know it's there's some anonymity there a little bit so, so is it when you're talking about these support groups is it like for alcohol or is it just in general for anything or there's different topics so we've asked our cfrc grads to pick they get to pick their day and time so one of them's going to commit to tuesday nights at seven o'clock whatever it is and they get to pick the topic that there is there maybe specialty so we may have a drug and alcohol um, specialist have their group will be addiction or their group will be alcoholism. We have one that's going to have one focused on trauma. We have one that's focusing on anxiety. You as a responder sign up for the month basically and you're going to sign up for the um, say PTSD class that's Tuesday at 8 and you're going to go every Tuesday at 8 you're going to sign onto that Zoom and you're going to be in there with that same facilitator with, with probably the same people because it's those people have committed to Tuesday nights at eight and they want to learn about PTSD. And so you go for a month. If you want to renew, you go the next month. It's 25 bucks a month. So oh, wow. to okay. go for an hour each week, like it's almost nothing. So we, again, we want to make it not an obstacle, but I then, but then I do pay the clinicians to facilitate those. So, you know, um, just to cover that cost and our platform cost, that's really all it is. So 25 bucks a month, let's say you signed up, you log on to Tuesday at 7 p.m., and your group is focusing on PTSD. And you have an hour Zoom with first responders only, and it is a mixture of disciplines, though we will have a police only and a fire only and a paramedic only group. Oh, we have a dispatcher group as well. I include Good, 911 yeah. dispatchers in everything. Um, so we'll have their own, di by discipline, if they only wanna to talk to cops, you don't wanna to talk to firefighters, or whatever, but but it's typically gonna be by topic. And the, gra and the facilitators are the counselors that have been have graduated from our cultural competency program. So it's not gonna just be some random somebody who wants to facilitate. So just just another way of providing support, just another outlet, you know, another avenue for your peer support team to say, this is this is a lot. It sounds like you could use some support. Hey, there's this there's this group. Like they they talk about PTSD every week. We want to do it. And you you go online, you enroll and you show up on Tuesday at 7 p.m. or whatever it is. So yeah. And there's so many reasons why that's such an incredible resource. First of all, like, you know, when you're the only person maybe leading a peer support team and it's uncharted territory, you right. have these resources across the nation 
right. to be able to rely on. And then I love the idea of that closed Zoom group because yeah. even though people may have resources locally, yeah. there's something some people they respond better to when they don't know people i yeah. I, i've noticed that in just doing For peer support sure. there are there are people that do not want to talk to people within their own agency but then of course there's people who will only want to do that right for sure. It's all about trust. And that's probably that that's probably that line is probably posted at the top of every one of my web pages because I just realize it and know that it's all about it's all about trust. And it's trust of your peers. Because I have I work with departments who the, the, the personnel will be like, I'm not talking to my peer support team. I know too much about their problems. They're more jacked up than I am. You know what I mean? Those 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 peer support teams need to be reevaluated and reselected and retrained. But I can't force that so I'm like okay then don't go to their peer support team but you work closely with that department at the county next to you do you know anybody of them and they're like yeah their peer support team's great call them up and ask if you can talk to their peer support team doesn't have to be your department it's all informal anyway there's no it's not a treatment plan it's not you're not you know a contract with them that you have to go see them go talk to some other peer support team if you know some department at you know whatever department has a peer support team in place Call them up. Say you want to talk to somebody on the phone. You don't have to tell them your name. You know what I mean? There's a lot of anonymity there. And talk to them. It gets peer support team members anywhere are not going to turn away somebody that calls them for help just because they're not in the department. Right. And we, you know, you made me think of something else. Some people have mixed feelings about this. But what we do locally is we train with and even when we have a critical incident, we'll do debriefings with dispatchers, fire and EMS, because yeah. we, we, if, if we've, especially, obviously we've all been on the same call mm-hmm. and I know some people don't like that, but we have found it to be very beneficial, um, in including everybody, you know, not all the time, but in, right. in those calls when it's relevant when pos- and, yeah. and because, you know, it's been helpful for, um, the dispatchers to, to hear what happened from the cops and for the cops to hear what the dispatchers of experience. And it's just actually really been very eye opening, even for me personally, because you don't necessarily realize how difficult their jobs are, which is completely different than what our yeah. jobs are. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody has their own perspective, even at the same incident, because mm-hmm. you're one, let's just, you're not standing in the same place. So you're just, your perspective mm-hmm. visually is not the same. Um, but to, but to come in from your discipline, I think joining everybody in the same room yeah, they don't always like it, but at the same time, when they're done, they hate it a lot less. You know what I mean? Like when they leave that room, they're like, "Oh, oh, I didn't think about so and so's vantage point or perspective or what they had to do after we left the call, or or the fact that the dispatchers didn't know and they wanted to know what happened. Is everybody okay that they talked to on the phone? You know, had that kid had that kid come out okay or not? That you know that closure thing. Um, the experienced ones have gotten used to not getting that closure. But it's still, it's because they've developed, uh, they've just developed the ability to do that, but they shouldn't have to. They're all a part of it. And and I think if you're all a part of the same call, having a debriefing, you know, debriefings are not just for the, they used to be for the, the logistical, the tactical part of it. Just what did we do right? What did we, what do we want to change next time? To having everybody that was on that call in that is going to be beneficial because what did we do? Oh, we got in fire's way. We wouldn't have known that if we didn't have fire in the room. You know, like we, oh, we needed to get out. Oh, we needed, they were wanting us to provide that. We didn't, oh, the dispatcher was like, oh, I didn't know you needed that information. Like you have to have that conversation. But but the mental health side of it, I didn't realize that you guys were so affected by what we saw or, or we should have covered that body up first before, you know, whatever it was. I mean, I'm just making sure, but <laughs> sorry. But, oh no, go for it. <laughs> I, I'm trying not to and it just comes right up. And just, just hearing other people's, um, experiences. One, somebody may be afraid to say, I walked in there and I was scared to death or God, that one was really hard. Somebody will say it and I'd be like, oh my God, me too. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's easier to, to deal with something when you know someone else experienced the same thing. And the more people, not the more people you have in the room, because that's not necessarily good, but the more, um, you allow it and normalize it for everyone to get in there, talk about their experience of one situation and incident, the more it's going to be like, God, oh, I didn't realize that. Or again, I'm back to everyone needs to, to try to understand everyone better. 
we just need to try to understand each other better. And every opportunity to do that is only beneficial. Yeah, we're so much better when we're together and in on these things together, because oftentimes in the first responder culture, and this is like a whole different topic, I feel like we're not so nice to each other. Right. uh, More than more times than not. And I think that needs to change. It's like family. It's the Mm -hmm. safe place where you can unleash and you know, you're still family, but, but the bat, the opposite should be true. You should treat the people who get you and support you and are there for you the best and unleash on the people that mean nothing to you. Not that you should unleash on anybody. I'm going to take that back. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I do. be yourself <laughs> around the people that love you, but be yourself in the best way as possible as well. You know, you have permission to be the worst side of you sometimes because, you know, they're unconditionally going to accept you. But you've you've also got to show the appreciation to the people that have your back all the time. Yeah. Yep. I couldn't agree more. Well, Amy, you have really given us a lot of information and you are, I learned so much about your platform. I mean, I knew that you did online training, but I didn't realize how, how much you had to offer. So thanks for, for kind of sharing all that. And if somebody listening wants to sign up, like even if it's not with their own agency, what, how easy is that for them to do? Super easy. So academyhour.com is the home base basically. Um, for all of the programs. You can go in there and and it'll link to the online classes. It'll link to the peer support. It'll link to the counseling. It'll link to everything. And as we add new things, it's always added. Academy Hour is the umbrella over the rest of it. So um, that's just the, that's the easiest way to get to everything. And so besides your online platform, you will also do, you personally will also do like some in-person trainings as well, correct? I do, yeah. So I travel the country teaching. Um, I have a six-hour class called The Trauma of Being a Cop, which is also uh, The Trauma of Being a Responder, depending on the audience. It's basically the same content because it talks about trauma and anxiety and stress and burnout and suicide and just a bunch of things, um, public criticism. Like we address a lot of things. But um, yeah, so I travel and teach that class. That's also on my website. Um, it's listed as the trauma of being a cop if you scroll down. But I speak at conferences. I teach all over. I teach classes. All my online classes that I created, I'll teach on site at different places. So yeah, I, I love the online thing because I can teach it once really, really well. And then it's just residual out there. But I also love the engagement in person with responders um, the conversations that I get to have with them, the connections that I get to make is really, really, I, I feel so honored that people bring me in and will, will pull me to the side and tell me their story and, and all of that. It's, I, I know that it is a huge privilege, um, and a huge responsibility that I have that I take it really, really seriously. Well, and there, it's just, even though online training is great, there's something very different about, especially with the kinds of things you're talking about to do it in person. For sure. For sure. And one other thing, you're an author too. So you've written a book (laughs) or a couple of books, right? Well, (laughs) well, you laugh. I thought you were really an author. Yeah. No, no, yeah. No, it's just funny because it's not something I I wouldn't expect you to bring up. So yeah, uh, I started a long time ago before, I think even before I got my, my counseling degree, I put, if you will, if you go to amazon.com, I can't believe I'm saying this. If you go to amazon.com and you use the keyword doodly couch. So it's it's like that again. I know. D O O D L Y couch. So I thought it was like like art therapy doodling and then a therapist couch. So it's kind of like do it's doodling journals is where I started with. But if you keyword that all my books are keyword doodly couch, that's how you can find them rather than searching for my name or whatever. Keyword Doodly Couch. I started a company called Doodly Couch a year, 10 years ago, probably. And I published all these books. And in the meantime, I have published their therapy journals or therapy workbooks. Um, but the post-action strategic debriefing, the debriefing mo- model that I use for my peer support um, is, a, is a debriefing model that I created and published. So that's where, that's where, that's where we had that conversation a while ago. But that book, that workbook's on there. Um, so yeah, you'll see all the books on there. And it's like, it's like doodling. It's, it, every page is a journal and it'll be like, there's one for firefighters, one for police officers, for law enforcement. And it'll say, but there's one for like children, um, for divorce that are going through divorce. And it, and it came from when I wanted to be a child psychologist, kids can't always, um, write in a journal and they don't necessarily want people to read their journal or they weren't old enough to write words. And so 
but I also put it as sometimes you just can't find the right words. And so you'll doodle. And so I made these, these journals that it says at the top of each blank page, it says, how do you feel today? And you circle kind of the right emotion. There's little faces there. And then you just draw or doodle. You can write whatever, but it's just doodling. Um, and I used it like my, both my parents have died and they were both uh, sat by them in the hospitals kind of thing, you know, facilities. And so there's one for the patient that's stuck in the, you know, somebody has surgery and you want to give them a crossword puzzle or you give them this book and they're, they can doodle. But there's one for the caregiver that's sitting there next to them to just kind of uh, to draw and record and, and doodle pictures um, and different things. And so it's just an outlet. So there's journals, there's workbooks, there's, I have a workbook for like um, reinventing your heal yourself. There's one. Um, it just, I don't even, I can't even think of them now. I created them so long ago, a lot of them. But the one we were talking about is that post-action strategic debriefing, which is um, the debriefing. It's a, it's a facilitator's guide to walk you through a debrief. Thank you so much. And I look forward to, to talking to you again. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Amy. If you find value in this episode, please share it, give us a review. And if you'd like to be notified of future episodes, you can subscribe on our Podbean website or email us at wendy at bluelineyoga.com. I'd love to hear from you with questions, suggestions for future guests, or topics that you'd like to hear about. You can email wendy at bluelineyoga.com or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thank you.